Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming to our session. Um, I'm Kathy Gross, and I'll be one of the co-facilitators this afternoon. Would you like to introduce yourself? And I'm Lucy McGowan, and I'll be the other co-facilitator. And that was a good example of something that I've been asked to tell you. Please make sure you turn on your microphones um, when, you, when you speak so that everybody here and everybody that's listening on the web can, can hear you. Um, if anybody would like to come move closer to the front, if there are spots available, everybody is welcome to do that so we can make it more of a more of an engaging, uh, intimate conversation, even though we've got a lot of, a lot of folks in here. And we're delighted to have John Orsini up here at the table with us, and he's offered to interject moments of wisdom in the conversation. So that's uh, quite a responsibility after lunch. I won't have much to say. <laughs> um, we have a lot to do in 35 minutes, and I'd love to go around and have people introduce themselves, but I think we would spend the entire 35 minutes doing that. So please forgive um, the lack of courtesy on, on that particular thing. Um, we want to have a discussion with everybody here in the room, so please feel free uh, to contribute to the conversation. As Lucy mentioned, please feel free to use your mic when you're doing that, but we want to make sure we hear um, from everybody's perspective uh, during our time today. Um, our task today, at the end of this 35 minutes, is we need to come up with an articulated challenge um, at the policy level related to the assessment of the interprofessional learner from education to workplace. To get us to that end point, we're going to do a couple things. Uh, first, we're going to have a discussion about some of the challenges. And we have some material, as you see before you, to help you um, with that discussion. And that should be a free-flowing discussion um, where we'll take what's uh, presented to us, but we might want to think beyond that. Uh, we're going to shift gears after that and spend a little bit of time talking about opportunities related to the policy level. And then in the last few minutes, we're going to try to pull it together and come up um, with the challenge that we want to articulate for this level. So it's an ambitious task, um, but I think one that we can do if we stay focused on the task. Um, so what we want to start out with you guys is to talk about challenges that um, are related to this particular level. Uh, what you have in your packet are a series of items that uh, members of the forum contributed ahead of time uh, to help populate the conversation. Um, so we thought that might be a good place to start with the group is have you take a look um, at those challenges that have been identified. And we'd just like to see at this point in time what resonates with people, what might be missing, what seems particularly important, and have a discussion on that for about 15 minutes or so before we shift into the opportunities component. So with that, you see here we have 11 challenges articulated. Um, and I know you've just got them in front of you, um, so take a minute and take a peek at it. But as soon as somebody's ready to jump in, we'd love to, to start the dialogue. What, what resonates with people in this group? Go ahead. Picking up on some of the conversation from this morning, um, I there was a lot of head nodding about the challenges we face in finding the good environment. So I'm, I'm focused on number seven, finding the environments for clinical placement. Thoughts on that? Other ideas? Um, just a query. Are we talking micro or macro level here? Right? This is at the policy level, so this policy is macro. Level, so macro level. Yeah. So, um, Okay, um, if, one of the things, so I guess we would be suggesting policy changes that would help facilitate assessment. We want to come up with a challenge at the policy level. So this is an opportunity for us well, to discuss a range of challenges to help us ultimately come to one challenge. I'm thinking that we institutional want. accreditation <laughs> issues. We have, we have accreditation issues for our academic programs. Yeah, and certainly interprofessional education accreditation uh, standards are important there, and the more consistent they are, the better. But similarly, to the extent institutions have their own accreditation, whether as uh, healthcare delivery systems or as uh, institutions that, that have a home for health professions education, the expectation for uh, IPE types of assessment and evaluation, mm -hmm. and then um, closing the circle on what's that showing within the, within those delivery systems with the a nice policy uh, yeah. to be working, having, having that kind of support to be working with. 
Lots of uh, good. I had a related comment, and that is, it, it seems to me that, that we are at a very tender moment in the policy arena that we haven't seized, and that is the development of the accountable care organizations, which are now sort of sweeping the country and are going to be, presumably, some version of that is going to be the sort of the, the system of care that's going to dominate uh, the delivery system. As far as I know, the criteria that have been established so far for, for having an accountable care organization recognized by CMS does not include education or training or any kind of evaluation of the team. If we could build into the accreditation or certification of accountable care organizations the requirement that they have assessment of their interprofessional teams, that would, it seems to me, be a policy change that would uh, go a long way towards identifying the the loci for this kind of activity. <clears throat> In the back? Yeah, go ahead. This isn't long-term policy, but I've been wondering about the CMS Center for Innovations and the practice grants that have gone out. I would love to see them put out one that relates to the practice and the education together so that it's an educational innovation within the practice. Some great ideas. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to continue the theme of accreditation mm -hmm. and identify um, a couple of organizations from the uh, sort of accreditation of organization side who are not part of this conversation yet, and one is JCO, because I think um, they've been there. I mean, they're the ones that produce the documents on the Sentinel events and the communication problems, and I think they've taken some actions there. And the other one that I'm aware of is the magnet process for nursing and institutions has a component in it around interprofessional. So, what are institutions doing in this area? Um, and both of those bodies are involved in some level of accreditation or recognition. That's a great suggestion. Those are terrific ideas. Thoughts on the ones that are in your handouts, or these are great additional ones to consider? Um, I think one that isn't up there that goes back to how the system is changing and the new delivery models mm -hmm. is all the new roles that are being created that are part of the delivery models that aren't in our vision for uh, assessment. Um, and um, the thing that's triggered my thinking about that recently is the new article on evaluating um, the, out the process for getting from uh, old time uh, primary care to patient-centered medical homes and the data that show the medical assistant got left out of the shift. So where are, uh, if we're assessing to workplace, where are all the new players in the new models in our, on the educational side? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Ann Santadonato from the Association of Women's Health Obstetric and Neonatal Nurses. Um, and I'd like to go back a step, I guess, to um, when you talk about the macro level, I think one of the potential challenges, if not barriers, is the acceptance in various healthcare institutions of various levels of providers. Um, you can do all the work necessary to promote and support interprofessional education in the academic settings. But if uh, you are working in institutions, so I guess this does go to proper placement, um, if you're working in institutions where um, various provider levels are not credentialed um, or are not allowed to be credentialed, um, that's a significant challenge. Um, yeah, and this is, um, it's a macro issue. I'm not sure what the agency is. That, um, but it's um, to bring back what uh, Malcolm said earlier to King IPE to the triple aim and really thinking about how do we just do that, you know, and make sure that that is a core outcome. And I would add to that, um, I think it was beautifully expressed by a guy named, a uh, physician named Douglas Wood, who's apparently head of strategic planning at the Macy Innovation Center, saying 
recently in hospital and health networks that what we need to be doing in this era is changing rapidly towards creating health from performing procedures. And so that's a, I mean, that's a values. He's, he's speaking to the triple aim there. But to really build in triple aim thinking into all of the IP is core outcomes. And I don't know where the pressure is going to come exactly for that. But uh, maybe there should be something on using assessments to improve IPE and IPP so that this is not just moving in one direction, but creating a feedback loop. I think a lot of great ideas thrown out here, and I'm just getting a sense of how difficult it is going to be for us to come up with one that we want to move forward. Um, I'd just like to get a sense from the group, or is there any one or two or three at this point that's starting to really feel like it's particularly important for us to focus on at the end? Um, I, I'm thinking from the, for, I would approach it from both the CMS and the, the Joint Commission perspective um, because uh, CMS obviously deals with the Medicare Medicaid population, but it doesn't deal with the other 50% of patients who are cared for outside of those systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's where the Joint Commission might come in, mm -hmm. in terms of um, developing policy around interprofessional education or um, uh, quality measures, mm -hmm. um, especially from the perspective of, of both of those organizations um, and or of an organization like NQF the National Quality Forum, um, where you have multiple accrediting bodies who are committed to the same type of, um, of uh, learning for healthcare professionals. Thank you. Love to hear from some other folks. Yeah. I guess the adage, you measure what you value and you value what you measure, might get to the heart of what um, you know, all of this touches upon. Um, and so figuring out what the points of leverage are to improve the use of um, information that you get out of, of measurement and then advancing the, uh, the practice of, of, quote, if you would, paying for um, on the basis of value um, could get us someplace. Mm -hmm. couple more minutes we can spend on this. Other thoughts? I'm not quite sure how to get, sorry, get this into the policy macro level, but I think that 11th point is really important. The idea of assessment that's conducted longitudinally over the cohort, I think that's always a, a more powerful method than taking snapshots of a cohort and trying to compare from a snapshot of one cohort to a snapshot of a different cohort, it's always really hard to then control all of the competing variables in that. That may get to issues of policy related to um, access to, to data and um, access to personal information and things like that to have the ability to track individuals over time. Yeah, I just wanted to add on uh, number seven, it's uh, finding, it's written as finding IPE clinical placements. And I really think that should be expanded to creating IPE clinical placements, which gets, which gets to the policy issue uh, of how that would be incentivized and how it would be operationalized. A couple head nods there. Thank you. I'm wondering, do we have any students in the room that might have thoughts on this? A number of them. Okay. Do you want to like to share? I think my biggest concern as a student is probably number one, um, how much time my school is going to dedicate to 
um, in a professional collaboration and how it's going to fit into my already um, highly packed <laughs> schedule, I guess, and um, what I can do as a student to kind of facilitate more interprofessional collaboration as well. So you'd like to see more, but you feel like your schedule is pretty crammed already. Yeah, that's the balance there. I'd like to add to the um, creating uh, IPE clinical placements that we think about um, training for those clinical partners. Um, it's in some parts of um, the United States, I think um, academia is a little bit further ahead with, mm -hmm. um, with the framework than the clinical partners. And so, um, you know, putting Having students and, and faculty well educated to um, to the clinical placements, mm -hmm. but then functioning alongside clinical partners who aren't on the same page. So the training piece mm -hmm. at the policy level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Please go ahead. I was looking at the number nine, the lack of clinical and administrative data. And I think from the policy perspective, what we're thinking about is the need to of some kind of a mandate for sharing and availability. And the other key problem we have is the platforms that are available um, that are not, uh, that cannot communicate with each other. So from a policy perspective, if we could bring some synergy to getting a platform that we were all using and then would share, we'd have more data. Um, okay, well, this is our first time with this, so bear with us. We're going to switch gears on you um, totally right now, but we want to let you have a few minutes to think about this conversation before we pin you down and commit you to coming up with your action step. Um, so we're going to switch over to the opportunities that have been suggested as well as any ideas you might have as opportunities to think about why this would be important to come up um, with a, a strategy to deal with this at the policy level. So have it up there. And again, these are opportunities that were suggested by forum members prior to this meeting, but we're welcome the discussion to open up to um, other opportunities that you might think about at the policy level. If you think that some of these opportunities are applicable to multiple challenges, please feel free to share those and bring those to, to our attention as well. A lot of them are, could be cross-cutting. Cross Agree, disagree. What we've not been able to do is convince third-party payers or much of the payment industry uh, to engage in that kind of investment in workforce development. And I think we have to get a lot better at that, not only because it's the real world of where our students are going, but also because we need the financial infrastructure to provide that training. Um, and it's not going to be able to pay for itself. Please. I also agree on that number four joint venture. I'm from an academic setting where I don't have a tie with the medical center, with the medical school, or any other health profession. So oftentimes as an educator, we have to act out roles between those. So we are really looking forward to some sort of policy or joint venture that will allow us to work with a medical center and or a medical school or a health professional center that will allow IP for our students as well. Because right now it's videos that we're looking at of IPE simulations that have occurred. I think when we're talking about assessment and opportunities, I think one of the biggest opportunities, just being able to be here and participate, and a question that comes to my mind is, is there an opportunity at this point to do a national assessment of healthcare institutions and academic institutions that provide health professional education to find out exactly how widespread IPE is? Um, because I don't know that we know that. 
Um, so perhaps the first step <laughs> is doing a, you know, a, a, a nationwide assessment of who's doing it and how, how they perceive they're doing and is there a disconnect or a connect between the percentages of academic institutions and healthcare institutions that are engaging in IPE? Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to piggyback on that comment. Do we actually have a rubric that begins to describe what IPE looks like in these institutions? So everybody says I have it, but I don't know what it is. And the degree of what that is, it ranges from both academic, clinical practice, collaborative partnerships. So is there actually a, a rubric that's an opportunity to get together and decide what is the rubric of what the depth and breadth of IP might look like so people who are on a continuum of development have a sense of where they are and how they could move in that continuum? Mm -hmm. Challenge thrown out. <laughs> All right, I'll come. Um, I, I think um, number two, incentivized tracking of practice outcomes data. I, I think one of the things that would be very helpful is if there, if we uh, are gathering regular data on the impact of of, of uh, IPE and IPP. Uh, I think that that's likely to be a driver of changes in systems, driver of reimbursement. Uh, and, and once there's a financial incentive downstream, uh, I think it's, um, that can be a, um, a strong motivator for creating more positions uh, within the workforce, which then backs up into the education system. So I know that that's starting at the, the, the tail end of this, but I, I think that uh, often what, what stops these things from happening is a financial disincentive. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's often linked to data. So I think if we have data, that's a good place to start. I just um, wanted to very much support that perspective. Um, you know, from the micro looking at the macro, mm -hmm. we can no longer look to small pots of money for grassroots kinds of activities. Um, and we really need to look to the healthcare system to fund these activities. And before we can ask the system to do that, we have to prove to the system that there's a return on that investment. And I think that when we can make that case, then the Joint Commission is going to get involved. Once the Joint Commission is going to get involved, then our health systems are going to react to that by creating more clinical placement opportunities, by training staff and faculty by engaging students so they have a trained workforce when they, when they come to practice. Mm -hmm. I think that, to me, is the most fundamental thing. And there's a lot of literature out there that says, in this unit, if we do this, we reduce bloodstream infections. But I'm not sure we've really made the business case mm -hmm. that needs to be made. Um. My first comment is seeking a uh, clarification regarding the difference between seven and six. I see seven as part of, uh, of six, mm -hmm. but maybe there's a difference. Uh, secondly, uh, I think one of the opportunities that might arise is um, the beginning to establish quality assurance mechanisms in the approach to IPE. Thank you. And just to clarify, these are just the responses that we got. There wasn't any consolidation of them. That's why you see things that might overlap a little bit. Well, are we ready to move on to the real heavy lifting that we have to do today? Okay. All right. So our job, as I understand it, is we need to put forward um, one challenge at the policy level related to the assessment of the interprofessional learner from education to the workplace. And we've come up with a number of ideas in addition to uh, the challenges that we had um, before us when we started this conversation. The ones I think that we talked about the most in our discussion was 
um, the idea related to field placements, uh, the quality of them, creating new ones, training the supervisors in that setting. So there seemed to be a synthesis around that particular one. Um, we also talked a lot about um, other players in, in the quality assurance area, accreditation standards, and how that could um, be an entity to work with at the policy level to try to overcome the challenge of having more IPE and also pulling in um, other entities like the Joint Commission and it was the Magnet Program you mentioned um, as well as, as another way that we could intervene at the policy level. Um, we talked about accountable care organizations, the possible uh, call for action from CMS Center for Innovation, um, we talked about the tying IP more clearly to the triple aim. I don't know. I think looking at looking at the conversation, it seems like accreditation and quality mm -hmm. issues, mm -hmm. quality measures, seem to be coming up repeatedly, and I'm wondering if those could be woven together mm -hmm. into a into a single coherent mm -hmm. statement of a challenge since they're so related. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know what the group thinks about that. Go that direction or to the field placement direction that seemed like that got a lot of energy yeah. too. Yeah. Could somebody speak to the, po the macro policy level piece mm -hmm. that um, is linked to the clini the clinical education, I mean, I'm trying, mm -hmm. these are all important yeah. areas, but I'm trying to think of what the policy intervention mm -hmm. would be um, at the macro level. That, that's a struggle I'm having with mm -hmm. a number of these. Go ahead. Well, one is that um, reimbursement. Uh, the, if your student services, even if they're supervised by a licensed practitioner, can't be reimbursed, then the practitioner can't take the time to provide the training. And so there are major issues with respect to CMS, Medicare, Medicaid related to reimbursement that make it possible or not possible for clinical settings to provide training. And so that's one that I know is, is very important. There are probably others as well. I can speak to another one. If you have one discipline being supervised by a supervisor in another discipline, you have accreditation issues. Uh, I'm a I'm a guest, so I guess I can speak. Um, uh, I'm a nurse practitioner educator, and one of the issues that we have is we are, um, of course, regulated by our state board of nursing, and the amount of hours um, that we can have our students in certain clinical settings, specialty versus actually what. Um, if they're going to be a family nurse practitioner, adult nurse practitioner, et cetera. So to have the latitude to offer experiences to students that might be a little different than what has normally been um, provided um, can be a roadblock for us. So can I get a sense from the group what your preference is in terms of what you want to put forward? Uh, to, to sort of piggyback on that that last comment, um, I think it's it's uh, one thing to have latitude to be able to do that, um, and in medicine, you know, the move toward maintenance of certification has created a whole set of mandates on the continuing education, uh, in the continuing education area. Um, I, it it might be valuable to go one step beyond latitude to a mandate mm -hmm. to have some. Um, uh, continuing education in some of these areas. Certain, certainly, maintenance of certification has really highlighted the the mandate to do quality improvement or performance improvement in practice as now a requirement for recertification. So, um, they they've already taken that step of mandating that kinds of thing. So, I, I think adding something around IPE uh, for different professions uh, wouldn't be too far out of line. It seems like there's there's kind of two ways: either try to m mandate what we think is ideal to happen, or try to create a situation where it actually can be allowed to happen. Because if we can't get the collaboration of the healthcare systems to work with us and the practitioners in the systems to work with us, it doesn't matter what we mandate. Mm -hmm. So I think 
that's why I'm back to the joint venture in some way and the policies that would prevent those kinds of joint ventures and that there has to be something in it for the healthcare system um, or the units to, to take in students. Well, that's kind of reformulating one of our opportunities into a challenge mm -hmm. that would then lead to some action steps. I mean, it's, it's kind of like that we can have all these ideals and all these rules about what we should do, but if we can't get access to the training settings because they're closed off because of macro policies related mm -hmm. to their attitudes towards training or having students and what their practitioners do in those settings, we won't be there. I think there's passion for all of these mm -hmm. elements. At the macro policy level, though, it seems that we probably represent most closely the professional accreditation and regulation. Mm -hmm. So if I were going to put some energy into something besides trying to get more money from the feds or the health systems, mm -hmm. I sure would wish. But anyway, I, I think that would be my suggestion for the policy level. And, and Steve started that conversation is that, you know, those of us in this these rooms um, probably can push that lever um, to make sure that there aren't barriers around supervision, there aren't barriers around time and, and that kind of thing mm -hmm. that makes it almost impossible to do what we're trying to do. That that um, speaks my mind because it links those two priorities it does. Mm -hmm. in a nice mm -hmm. way. Can I uh, kind of poke a needle needle a little bit and, and ask a question? I think there was an there was another parallel discussion about the need for data in order to drive some acceptance and open up the space at at you know at both institutions at, at with with uh, with partners. Um, for acceptance and, and funding of more IPE opportunities. Is, is the generation of that data, quality data, a necessary step towards um, the development of a more mature inclusion of, of IPE in the accreditation process? I think, I think it's probably provided the data point to the efficacy and cost effectiveness of IPE. Mm -hmm. I think the data are critical to creating a work environment where it is um, uh, promoted and part of part of the operations of the work environment. And without having a work environment that uh, accepts and actually implements IPE. Uh, there's no place to put your trainees. But I think um, a lot of workplaces and some of the accreditors like the Joint Commission already have data that would be very useful as part of making the case. So I think, you know, the most obvious one is the Joint Commission's analysis of Sentinel events and communication problems. Um, that drive those Sentinel events. I mean, in a sense, some important data already exists in some of these places where we see some policy levers. Yeah. So that might be a step in the progression towards making this policy level changes, collecting that data where it's mm -hmm. available. A lot of folks in the room we haven't heard from, and we're making some decisions about recommendations we're going to give to our last group. So I want to make sure we're capturing the sentiment of the group here. Is anybody not agreeing with the direction this is taking? Everybody feels like it's just such an obvious thing we should move forward? I've really appreciated the suggestions of the number of um, already existing standards that are in, in place through our credentialing agencies. Mm -hmm. um, and I also appreciated the point of, you know, focusing our attention to the triple aims and making that the core outcome. Mm -hmm. 
and ACOs are already doing that, if we're able to do that in education as well, then we're collecting like data. And what if we had a meaningful use sharing mm -hmm. <laughs> of like data mm -hmm. that would inform both the practice setting and the educational setting? So could we fold that into an action step towards this policy level change, you think? Okay. I'm getting that thumbs up. Um, anybody else have any f one final comment or we're right at time? Well, thank you all. I know this is a really big group to have a discussion like this, so I really appreciate all the input and time to switch rooms.